Hello, folks. Welcome to our next Holy Week service on Tuesday. And we will continue to journey through John's Gospel and hopefully learn some lessons. I'm going to uh, begin with a short prayer and then we will um, turn to the text in John chapter 18. I'm not going to read the long ish passage um, at the beginning. Uh, if you got your Bible, uh, you might like to cast your eye down the text and uh, see uh, where we're going to go. Um, but I'll take and read a few verses uh, at a time as, as we go through it. But let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you, Lord, that as we continue to read and think about the arrest and trial and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, that our hearts will be drawn out towards him and that as he is lifted up, that we will see him and trust him and seek to serve him all our days. In Jesus' name, amen. So John chapter 18 and verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So uh, who was this character, um, Annas? He was a, a former high priest. Uh, and he, uh, you might think of him as uh, the most powerful of the high priests throughout uh, the first century in Palestine for over a, a 50 year period. He or one of his uh, five sons and a grandson as well, I think, uh, together with this uh, son-in-law, um, Caiaphas, uh, they were high priests. Uh, <clears throat> Annas was a, a very powerful figure uh, in the background, even though he is um, retired, as it were, might make you um, think of a man who some people think looks a little bit like me, uh, who was at one time um, president of the organization that he ran, indeed, for many years. Uh, he's no longer in office, but uh, he is a powerful figure in the background. Uh, so Annas was that kind of powerful uh, figure. And verse 14, uh, in verse 14, John reminds us that uh, Caiaphas has said something significant before. Uh, just to take you back a little bit, you'll remember that as we go through John's gospel, we have thought of it as four journeys that Jesus takes uh, to Jerusalem and back to Galilee at the time of a feast. Uh, chapter 11, in um, a way, acts as a, as a preface to the final journey, uh, the story of Lazarus, and then this discussion amongst the Jews about how they will kill him and get rid of him. Before we come uh, to the beginning of the journey itself, in chapter 12, when the king rides into his city, and Jesus predicts his death, and as a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, uh, the nature of his death when I'm lifted up will draw all kinds of people to myself. Uh, so let's just turn our minds back briefly to chapter 11 and to that discussion that verse 14 uh, alludes to uh, when Caiaphas had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die. Uh, John eleven forty nine 49 says, but one of the Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Do you not understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish? He did not say this on his own account, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Of course, we understand that uh, Caiaphas meant that in a political sense. 
He thought it would be better to get rid of this man, Jesus, uh, for the sake of the nation. And as he speaks, uh, John says he speaks uh, prophetically as the high priest. And of course, he says more than he really knows. And uh, God is ultimately uh, in control. And it's interesting that no more, uh, uh, no more clearly do you see than at the uh, arrest and uh, trial and crucifixion of the Lord Jesus, uh, the amazing um, juxtaposition of human individual freedom and choice and the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Um, Caiaphas said this, he said it um, in his own terms, he meant something political by it, but of course God was ultimately in control and God would use his words to fulfill a greater purpose. Yes, there would be one who would die for the nation, who would gather the children of God together, but not in the way that Caiaphas meant. God had something bigger and better in mind. So John just reminds us of that. Uh, and now Jesus is uh, arrested and his trial will follow. His trial, of course, will be something of a farce. Uh, starting here in the house of um, Annas and this reference to uh, Caiaphas. It's very telling the word that Caiaphas um, uses when he says that it would be expedient that one man should die. The trial here will focus on expediency rather than on truth. Now, of course, we know that sometimes that's exactly what human governments do. In Britain, of course, uh, bribery is a crime. But if it should be that some wealthy Saudi prince wants a couple of million to uh, make sure that the government puts in the order to buy uh, British jets, fighter planes. Well, um, okay, uh, but bribery is still a crime. And so when the Crown Prosecution Service wants to investigate that case, they're told to shut it down because it's not in the national interest. Expediency. They might not like to admit it, but we know about it. And so we will see it here. His trial uh, is a farce. And um, now there follow some stories that we uh, know quite well. Um, let me suggest to you perhaps that one of the themes that might link them together in some way is the question of evidence. Of course, at a trial, uh, evidence is important. Uh, the prosecution will bring forward their evidence. If there's not sufficient evidence, then the jury should not find the um, accused person guilty. They should be um, released. Um, and then the defense, of course, will try and marshal evidence on their side to um, support their case. Verse 15. Simon Peter followed Jesus. And so did the other disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl <coughs> who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now, the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter was also with them, standing and warming himself. Of course, most of the disciples have already fled uh, but Peter is still following at some uh, distance. And this character described as the other disciple, uh, who was he, almost certainly 
Um, of course, he was John. And uh, describing himself in this way was just um, a kind of modest way of um, doing it. Uh, he had gone in. Um, John was well connected. Um, his family was probably a much more um, wealthy family than some of the families of the other um, disciples. And John's dad, perhaps, was uh, a, uh, an important businessman in the fishing trade. Um, and uh, he was known to um, the high priest. And so um, John, this other disciple, has a word with a servant girl who's um, at the door. And so Peter is brought in. And then the uh, servant girl says to him, quite naturally, I suppose, um, oh, uh, are you one of this man's disciples as well then? To which emphatically Peter replies, no, I am not. Really? Um, I mean, the evidence was plain enough, was it not? Uh, it was John who had told the girl to let the man in. And so when Peter comes in and this innocent enough kind of question is asked by the servant girl, uh, Peter denies it in spite of the evidence. Just in passing, will you notice that there is a charcoal fire that the officers and servants are gathered around uh, to keep themselves warm? We will see another charcoal fire when we come to chapter 21, but we'll leave that for then. Verse 19, the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. So the high priest has two areas of inquiry, the disciples and his teaching. You'll see how Jesus responds to each. The inquiry about his disciples, with regard to that, Jesus says nothing. Now, of course, he could have said something, though what he might have said might sorely have embarrassed uh, Peter. And, uh, and even John, uh, he could have said something like, uh, my disciples, well, there's one of those chaps over there, you could ask him. Uh, well, um, Jesus didn't do that. Secondly, then, with regard to his teaching, he does give an answer. And this is how he answers in verse 20. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in the synagogues and, and in the temple where the Jews all came together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him. If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? In the search for evidence, Jesus says to the court or to Annas, I have spoken openly. Uh, these three years as I've traveled around um, Galilee and Jerusalem, I've spoken in the synagogues and in the temple. Nothing was said in secret. Now, of course, this is not to deny that Jesus had spoken privately with the disciples, for example, in that long block of teaching we've looked at in the upper room. Um, but there was nothing that he said there that he would not mind being shared with the whole world. In other words, uh, there was no secret conspiracy. Jesus was not part of some plot in order to overthrow either the Romans or the Jewish authorities. He'd spoken openly. So he says, ask the crowd, get them to bear testimony, to bear witness, get the evidence from them, get honest witnesses. And of course, in the other gospels, we're told that these um, scribes and Pharisees um, got false witnesses. Indeed, they bribed people in order to give false testimony about Jesus and their false testimony contradicted themselves, of course. And now uh, here an officer in this kangaroo court strikes Jesus. 
What's that way to speak? Uh, what way is that to speak to the high priest, he says. And uh, Jesus answers. Uh, if what I said is wrong, bear witness. In other words, uh, what evidence have you got to say that what I have said is not true? But if, I, if what I've said is right, then why do you strike me? And then verse 24, Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Shortly, he will be sent on to Pilate and his trial before Pilate will continue. He said a few things about that on Sunday and we'll return again, perhaps to some of it tomorrow. But first we return to Peter and you see how John doesn't labor the story of the accounts in the four Gospels of Peter's three denials. This is the shortest one. In verse 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also, are you also not one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. Again, uh, we have this little theme of question of evidence. Here is a relative of Malchus, the servant of the high priest, who had his um, ear removed with uh, Peter's sword. Of course, the other Gospels tell us that Jesus uh, healed the man and his ear was restored. Um, man says, didn't I see you there? Uh, this is an eyewitness. So um, the evidence is fairly clear. But Peter again denies it. As I say, um, John tells the story quite briefly. He makes no mention of the curses that Peter calls down and the swearing that he does and so on. But now this is the third time. In fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus had made, that Peter denies the Lord. In spite of all his bravado and, and bluster, now I put under the pressure of this crowd of an ordinary little servant girl and this uh, relative of the... Um, man who lost his ear, Peter flatly denies the Lord. And the crowd turn on him and they say, Peter, you liar. Hmm. No, I made that bit up, didn't I? That's not what they say. You see, friends, the world will not mind if we deny the Lord Jesus. In spite of all the evidence, if we take the side of the world, if we deny the Lord, the world will be quite happy to let us go that safe way. So the rooster crows. Roosters crow at dawn, of course. What a long, dark night it had been. And what a dreadful day was yet to come. But that, of course, is not the end of the story. There will be the light of a new day and of hope to come. Even for Peter. There will be another charcoal fire we'll come to in chapter 21. When Peter is restored by the risen Christ, who has now conquered death and is alive. And is there to gather together the children of God. The word that Caiaphas had spoken, uh, albeit unknowing uh, exactly what uh, it was uh, he was saying, that one would die for the nation and also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad, scattered as far as places like Carrick Fergus, and so as we journey with Peter, perhaps we have some sympathy with him. Perhaps there have been times when we have let the Lord down. We have denied him. The world has been quite content with our denials. 
It's only when we stand up against the world and stand for the truth of the gospel and of the Lord Jesus Christ that the world may be inclined to persecute us. So whatever the dark night has held, whatever the difficulties and trials we have faced, we come now to a new resurrection morning. And Christ comes to restore us and to renew us and to give us his grace to be his children, his servants, and his faithful followers, even to the end. And let's pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for this passage of scripture that speaks so many things to our hearts. We've just touched on some of the truths. May your spirit apply the truth that will be helpful to us. And may we learn from Peter's mistake. May we consider the evidence that there is, that we might be convinced and know that the words that this man has spoken are true. And he is the one who has come from the Father, the one who will be lifted up to die and then to rise again. And the one who will be able then to restore us to the Father's family. So Lord, bless us this day and those that we're concerned for, for our Prime Minister, uh, for those who are um, working so hard in our various uh, hospitals and trusts and in the Department of Health and others who are serving the community in other ways, risking themselves to be of service to others. Bless them and keep them safe today. Watch over those that we are concerned for in our church family and in our circle of family and friends, some who are ill, uh, some uh, who are fearful and anxious, uh, some who are feeling so lonely and isolated. Draw near to them and grant them your grace. And may your blessing continue with us as we journey on together through this Holy Week. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, uh, that's our thought uh, for Tuesday. And hopefully you will be able to find us again uh, tomorrow. And we'll have another um, passage from John's Gospel. God bless you.